Reverend Libby Lane, currently the vicar at St. Peter's in Hale and St. Elizabeth in Ashley, will be consecrated as the 8th Bishop of Stockport tomorrow. The ceremony is taking place at York Minster Cathedral. I caught up with Libby at her home. Can I say what a pleasure it is to meet you, first of all? Thank you, Mike. It's lovely to be with you. You've had some time now since the announcement in December to think about this. So how are you feeling at this point in time? Well, the last six weeks have been a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, I'm really fortunate that the the church communities that I'm currently serving have been so supportive and encouraging, and we've shared a wonderful Christmas together, and that's really helped. And it's good to be able to move on knowing that the places I'm going from are in such good heart. The consecration is now, as you say, um, just around the corner, and it is beginning to get exciting. Often when people are nominated uh, a bishop, they have months between their appointment and their consecration. And we've had just a few weeks and there's been Christmas and New Year in between. And so it has felt very, very quick. But there are hundreds of friends coming to the service and thousands of well-wishers who are going to turn up and it is a very exciting occasion and I am looking forward to being part of an historic ceremony and moving on to beginning my ministry here in the Diocese of Chester as the Bishop of Stockport. So I've got lots of difficult questions (laughs) to ask you between now and the end of this interview. How did it all happen? The previous Bishop of Stockport had been translated to Exeter. He's now the Bishop of Exeter. And so there was a a vacancy in the diocese. And the diocese began their usual process of making an appointment to a vacant see and explored the possibilities of those who might be considered. Went through the process of selection and shortlisting and interviewing. And all that was going on before the legislation to allow women to be consecrated bishops had finally gone through all its processes. That process didn't arrive at somebody that that the diocese felt was the right person for the post. And so at that point, it became possible to consider whether a woman might be the right person for that post. And so uh, very soon after the legislation had gone through, I was invited to interview. And a a couple of weeks later was interviewed at the end of November for the post by 11 people from the diocese, uh, covering a whole range of the diocese's life. Um, I'd previously been through the process that had helped the church and me to discern whether ministry as a bishop was the right thing to be considering. And so it was at the end of November that I was invited to take up the role and two weeks later the announcement was made. Now, I have an apology here because we spoke on the show some time ago. I can't remember how long ago. But worse than that is we can't find the tape of that interview. (laughs) And I promise you, we've looked everywhere. Um, What did you have to say in that interview about women bishops because I'm sure I asked you about that. I think you did ask me about that and and I remember looking forward with great hope um, to the possibility that this time would come. I think as the news of my announcement made very clear, um, I've never been considered a a kind of a public front runner uh, for being a woman bishop, never mind the, the, the first woman bishop. I'm sure you did in that interview cheekily ask me whether I, I can't imagine you didn't, uh, <laughs> ask, me we- I. <laughs> ask me whether I fancied the job, and I'm sure I said something uh, very restrained. I mean, it was uh, an unexpected announcement in terms of uh, public profile, and it certainly wasn't anticipated by me uh, in advance. I mean, as I say, uh, the church had been exploring with me whether at some point this might be uh, a ministry that I would consider, but that it all happened so quickly and that it that it happened here was, was very unexpected. I'm, I'm very happy being vicar of Hale and Ashley and with the role I have in the diocese as um, the Bishop's Dean for Women in Ministry and the roles that I've had elsewhere in the church, including the role I've had as participant observer from the Northwest Diocese as one of eight women in the House and College of Bishops for the past year. I wasn't 
looking to move, but it is very exciting that this opportunity has come now. So here's another nice, easy question for you. Why you? I think that really is an answer that has to be given by people around me and the people who made the choice. What I have always done in my ministry is to try and be alert and open to the promptings of God and his spirit as to uh, where he might be calling me and then to do the very best job I can do with the gifts and experience and skills that God's given me in the place that I am. And that's what I was doing here in Hale and Ashley and with the other wider roles um, when this invitation came. I really think those who made the appointment are better equipped to say why they felt I was the right person for the post. It is about being the right person for this role, for being the Bishop of Stockport at this time. The fact that the way timings have happened mean that I'm the first woman to to be announced as a as a bishop in the Church of England is just the way those timetables of vacancies have worked out. I've been enormously grateful that I have known the colleagues among whom I've worked, that the way my ministry has been has meant that I have had contact with other exceedingly gifted and experienced women within the church who have helped to support and to shape my ministry previously and have been wonderfully encouraging over the past few weeks and have been able to see something of bishops at work in the wider church as well as um, the staff in this diocese at work and and perhaps those things have come together in a way that means that this is less daunting than it might be for somebody who was coming into a completely new place with new people and a new role. Perhaps this is the right role at the right time. And one of the things I really do hope is that some of the attention that has been given to me at my announcement means that the women who follow me perhaps will have slightly less of that constant attention when their announcement is made and that if in any way I help to make their transitions into their ministries an easier one then that's an honour to have been able to do that and there will be women who will follow me into roles that will have a higher profile and will have more obvious um, influence but if this announcement means that their task is made even the slightest bit easier then um, it's been a privilege to be able to do that that. that's all very well but listen in a thousand years time when they're talking about the eighth bishop of stockport aligned to that will be the first woman bishop in the church of england how does that make you feel well very early on somebody said to me you do know that you are now destined to be the answer to a pub quiz question for the rest of eternity. What was the name? More, of more the likely first, to be mastermind. Ma- the well, <laughs> the first woman bishop. It is something in no way sought. It has been quite hard to adjust to the media attention. Um, it's not something I've been used to. I mean, I have been on um, your show, Mike, and we've had interviews, but uh, and I've done small scale things but the amount of attention that there has been uh, around this announcement has not been something that I would ever have sought and it has been quite an adjustment to make. I've been enormously supported and helped by any number of people and that's been great and almost universally the attention has been constructive and positive and encouraging and I've been really grateful for that as well. I haven't honestly had time to really take on board, I think, the momentousness of the place that it turns out um, I have in the church's history um, and in the, the, the public mind because there's been so much else going on in sh- such a short space of time. I think it will take some time for that to kind of settle in. Obviously, there's been a few dissenting voices. There, they've been around for, for decades and they feel that women should not have access to the role 
to which you, you, you've been selected. What do you say to them? That a bishop's task as the service of consecration makes clear is to heal and not to hurt and to build up and not to destroy and I take that responsibility very seriously and I know that my appointment has caused some discomfort, distress indeed for some within the church and beyond it. I'm at peace with my sense that this is the task that God has called me to following on from that invitation and that confirmation from the church about this specific task at this specific time. The church as an institution was very clear that it understood under God that the time was right to make the decision that all the orders of um, ordination in the Church of England should be equally open to men and women. And that's the context in, in which this um, invitation to be the next Bishop of Stockport has come. But that same legislation made it very clear um, that those who could not accept my ministry or the ministry of the women who will follow had uh, an honoured place in the church and that they were faithful Anglicans and I'm committed to making sure that that place for them is secure and that we work together for the continuing flourishing of people within the church who are committed to the growth of God's kingdom. And there are those within the Diocese of Chester who will need to look for alternative support um, other than from me or from uh, the bishops around me. Um, and I will work with the Diocesan Bishop to make sure that, that they have that. Um, I think the church is a healthier place for being a community in which dissenting voices are heard and honoured. I believe that we are better people for being open always to the possibility that God has new things to teach us and new ways of understanding what he's calling us to do. The church has made its very clear decision that the role of bishop should be open to women as well as men. The church has, against or at least without my anticipation, recognise that this is a role to which they believe I am called. The Diocese of Chester has identified that they believe I am the right person to take up this role now. And I am at peace that this is the right step for the next stage of my ministry. And I hope I can do it with the full breadth of those within this diocese and beyond whatever their theologies or churchmanships that we can work together for God's kingdom. I want to take you back into time now. This is a question we ask a lot of our guests and it's, it's a very simple question. It's how did you come to faith? I was loved into faith by a small village church community in rural Derbyshire. I began going to church when a friend invited me to a youth group at the age of 11. My family were not church attenders and so um, on a Sunday I would walk from the valley that I lived in across the hill to the valley that my friend lived in and go to her church and, and attend her youth group. Um, I went the first week that Annie invited me and really enjoyed the church service and wanted to go back the following week. And when I went back, the vicar there remembered my name. And that made an enormous difference to an 11-year-old child turning up on her own in a, in a church that didn't know her and, and knew nothing of her, that they cared enough to remember my name. And they embraced me in the, into their wider church family. And their love for me made real Christ's love for me. And they loved me into faith. And they nurtured my gifts and they encouraged me to exercise a ministry there as a teenager and supported me when I moved on to university and rejoiced with me when I began to explore the possibility of ordination while I was at university. It was a local Church of England church and the people in it 
who by living their faith out day by day and including a child who turned up on her own at church um, into that that led me to Christ. And what kept you there after all those years when so many people start off like you did then drift away? Well I believe that's God's faithfulness to me that God loved me and resourced me and carried me through all the years since that 11 year old child first turned up at church. God very graciously provided people around me at every age and at every stage of my life and ministry to pray for me, to laugh with me, to challenge me, to be honest with me and to help me through those times when things were difficult or I was struggling to work out which way God wanted me to go. I've been very blessed that almost from the moment I first turned up at church, God's presence with me has felt real and profound and I've never lost that sense. Um, And I know that I'm very, very blessed in that. And so God's presence with me is as integral and as necessary as breathing and often is as unconscious as breathing. Um, But the way that um, enlivens my life and informs who I am and shapes what I do is as fundamental and as necessary as oxygen it it is who I am and I've never not known that and I know that's not everybody's story and I have a great deal to learn from those who've had to wrestle with much darker times than I've have ever lived through yet and there is a real yet about that but I don't think that's anything to my credit I think God's been very gracious and generous to me to allow my journey to be like that. And it may be that in years to come, I need the support of those for whom their journey has been more difficult. But my own journey is that I have known Christ alongside me at every step along the way. The next step. I noticed when I came in that you were reading your little booklet. Firstly, tell me what the booklet is, as if I didn't know. (laughs) Um, I picked this up to have a look at this because I thought you might be asking me about it. It's the order for the consecration service uh, when I am made bishop. And I thought we might be talking about it. And so I thought I'd I'd have a look and, and remind myself about what's in the service and what it's all about. So tell me a little bit about it then. Well... Being made a bishop is done within the context of a service of Holy Communion and I think that's really important because communion services for Christians who go to church week by week are a, are that weekly reminder that all we do and all we are is set in the context of Jesus' story, of his love for us and that reminder every week of the Easter story that Jesus loved us so much that he died for us. And as we share bread and wine, we remember the story of Easter and Jesus' death on the cross and our place in that story. And so the next step of my ministry is within the context of that story of the love and sacrifice of Jesus for me and for all of us. And so whatever I'm asked, to take on is only a tiny giving back of what God has given to me and to us in Christ. Within that context, there is, as um, you might expect of a a service in the Church of England, uh, a great deal of prayer and party. It's what we do best. There's a lot of pomp and ceremony and inherited ways of doing things. There are elements of this story, of this service that have been part of the church's Church of England story since Tudor times, including what I shall be wearing, which is a remarkable thing with some wonderful names. Rochich and Shamirs and uh, anyway, it's uh, there are big baggy sleeves and and long gowns. Did you you pick it up Um, at (laughs) M&S? 
<laughs> I've had it made beautifully for me uh, by a company in uh, Newcastle. Um, all the things I'll be wearing as a bishop have been made for me. Those outfits have had to be amended because they've never made them for a woman before. As a silversmith in, in Stockport who's making my uh, cross, there's a um, a craftsman in uh, G Cross who's making my staff and uh, uh, a craftsman in Derbyshire who's uh, making my uh, bishop's ring um, from Blue John Stone, which is only found in Derbyshire, which will be a permanent reminder to me of the nurture of my faith in that county uh, where I first went to church. So there are lots of very personal elements about the service, but its form is based on what has happened for centuries and what is done with and around me. It's been done with all those bishops with whom I'll serve and all the bishops who will come after me. There are legal things. I will have to swear oaths of allegiance and sign legal papers. There are parts of the service where the church as a whole and all those who are gathered and those who've been part of the selection process publicly affirm that they believe that I am the right person for this post at this time. I'm asked to assent to that, that this is something I'm willing to take on. Archbishop will pray for me and he will lay hands on me to make me bishop along with more than a hundred bishops from this country and from around the Anglican Communion who are travelling to be present um, at this service. It's, thinking about it, is um, very emotional. I mean, it's a remarkable thing that um, people are, that this happens to be me and actually people have been very supportive of me personally, but actually this is about a moment in the church's history and the prayers of those bishops and archbishops and uh, the clergy who are gathered and the people who are gathered in that place and who are holding me in their prayers across this country and around the world at that moment when the prayer of consecration happens will be, I'm sure, a, a very profound, remarkable moment for me then and into my future ministry. When that is done, there are symbols of my ministry that are passed to me, a Bible and my staff, and I've mentioned I'll be wearing my cross and, and the ring that's that, that are being made for me. When that is done, we move actually to what is more important about the service and together share communion and put all that has been happening um, in the context of the Christian story of which this is just one tiny step. And I hope that that story, Christ's story, the story of his love and guidance to me, but the promise that he makes and that we remember at every communion service that we have that his love for us is endless and knows no limits. I hope that that is what is heard and seen by the people um, who watch the service and who are present at the service. Now, I don't want to jump the gun in any way, shape or form, but this is just the start of a whole new journey. And it means that once you become bishop, a whole new set of doors begin to open. One of these is Parliament. The government has fast-tracked, if my information is correct, the rules so that women bishops will be moved into into the House, House of Parliament. Uh, in fact, some men, as the bishop mentioned to me when I spoke to him over Christmas, will get pushed back slightly as more women come along. What do you think of that and that decision to fast track, first of all? Well, the process of, of um, making those decisions is still under discussion. And the uh, impetus for those changes came both from government and uh, from within the, the House of Lords and from within the body of bishops themselves. And those conversations were begun before women were uh, certainly any specific women were considered for roles. So it's not that women themselves have tried to put pressure on uh, changing the system. One of the things that the Church of England is, is very conscious of 
wanting to work towards is to ensure that the voice that we articulate is that that is on behalf of the whole of the country. Church of England churches are present in every community and there are Church of England clergy who live and serve in every community. And it is those voices that the bishops in the House of Lords, it's their voices that they work to articulate um, and want to make sure that that is as as wide ranging and as inclusive as it can be. And um, wanting some of those voices to be heard through a woman's voice is one of the ways that they're hoping to do that. The bishops who sit in the in the house at the moment are the small number of bishops who hold posts that have uh, automatic roles. A handful of bishops, whoever is appointed those posts, have a seat in the House of Lords. And the other bishops who sit in the House of Lords are all diocesan bishops, but they serve in order of seniority according to how long they have been serving and that's where the question arises about whether women who are appointed diocesan bishops simply wait as their male peers would until the next vacancy becomes open or whether there is a way to enable those women's voices to be heard sooner than they might otherwise do. Those conversations are still going on. I think the Church of England does have a responsibility to ensure that a whole range of those within our country who we represent have things articulated on their behalf. And I think if women may have uh, a, a role in doing that. There will be mechanisms in place and I think it's very important that if those who women who are appointed diocesan bishops in the next year or so do get a place more quickly than they might otherwise in the House of Lords, that they're given the additional support to be able to exercise that uh, very public and important uh, role on behalf of the nation uh, because they won't have had time to acclimatise to being bishops themselves before taking on that task as their male peers might have done if they go through more quickly. Give me a, a shortened version of what bishops in the House of Lords do. Bishops sit on the crossbenches so they, they, they're not tied to a political party and what they do along with the other peers appointed in the as it is to provide a non-political voice to help to shape and to inform the debate and the decision-making process for our nation. And they speak out of, as I have said, their experience and the experience of their clergy and the people in the churches and the communities that those churches serve to try and ensure that those things that might otherwise not get heard do get heard without any party political overlay. Now, this next question, you'll have to excuse it because I don't know the answer, so I'm going to ask it. Will you automatically be going to the House of Lords? No. My post is to be what's called a suffragan bishop, uh, which is an assistant bishop in the diocese to work alongside the Bishop of Birkenhead, who's also an assistant bishop, and our diocesan bishop, the Bishop of Chester. So I wouldn't be eligible for this in this current role. It's only diocesan bishops. And would that be something you would aspire to? Aspiration in the Church of England is not something that we do very readily. I have to say it's beyond me really at the moment getting my head and my heart around the role of being Bishop of Stockport and thereby the first bishop in the Church of England. I have no aspiration or expectation beyond that ministry. Uh, That is more than enough for me to be um, engaging with. Thank you. (laughs) I think I will have one final question for you before I outstay my welcome. What are you going to say to the first person who comes up to you as a bishop after the consecration and says, Bishop, what's going to become of the world? When we look at the news or listen to the news, day after day, it's horrible and it's getting worse. What will be your answer to that? That I work to look at the world through Christ's eyes and that all that the world faces 
much of which, as you say, and that we see on our televisions and our newspapers and hear on the radio and, and explore online, is enormously troubling and disturbing and distressing. There's a great deal that's very good as well that gets much less attention, but that God is present in the things that are good, but also alongside those who are living through that which is, for many of us, unimaginable. My response can only be out of my own experience, which is that all that we live through is somehow held by God um, and that he is faithful. I wouldn't want to begin to try and give solutions or answers or to pretend that I have ways forward that that others don't know. I will commit myself to continuing to pray, not just for those who are in my immediate care, but for the issues of the wider world. And if it is that my voice, that the attention that is given to me because I happen to hold this place as the first woman bishop in the Church of England, if that attention can be used in ways that will make better the lives of those, particularly those who are most vulnerable, then I will continue to be open to wanting to lend my voice and my weight to ensuring that we fulfil our calling as people of faith, as those who follow in the footsteps of Christ to build a better world, to grow the kingdom of God. And if there are ways that I can contribute to that, then I pray that that will be something that this new role may enable me to do. Well, very soon you won't be Reverend Libby Lane anymore. So let me say, Reverend Libby Lane, thank you very much indeed for taking time to speak to me today. Uh, Mike, it's been a real pleasure um, to, to sit down and to speak with you again. Thank you for making the time to come and speak with me. And I look forward to catching up with you again before too long. Thank you. <laughs>